nuclear lunch detected. <laughs> I like this instead of a nuclear lunch. It looks kind of like a, a nuclear mushroom cloud. <laughs> but instead, of, no, it's just a pizza that's <laughs> imploded. All right, let's look at nuclear fission reactions. We're going to be concentrating on fission. And fission is going to be, well, let's first look at this uh, binding energy per nucleon curve. I think that'll sort of help us to kind of remind ourselves what's going on here. Remember, this peak right here is at uh, iron 56. And remember what we're going to say up here. We want for things to go up. That's when things are going to happen naturally. So that means over here, for example, well, that could be fusion, sure, but I actually don't care about fusion. I'm only caring about fission in this case. Fission is when you go from heavy things, so a large nucleon number, to smaller things. And remember the reason why is because you need to go up on this curve. So if you go up, that means you have to go left. So in this case right here, this is where we're doing fission. So fission is going to be energetically favorable with larger um, number of nucleons. So fission happens mostly with elements that have a nucleon number of greater than 230. Uh, so that's like where most of them are. So they'll be, they'll be over here. These ones right here are going to be the ones we're uh, thinking about and analyzing here. So what is spontaneous fission? Turns out that's when fission can happen by itself in nature. They've seen this actually happen in some caves and some areas, you know, like when they're actually digging, uh, for example, scientists are, you know, digging into the ground, they can see some signs that, hey, you know, this, this uranium rock, for example, something like that ended up actually having fission by itself. It's not super common, of course, but it can actually happen with either thorium or uranium-235, 238, whatever. And they usually release these neutrons. Remember, neutron is going to be written like this. It's got no protons, but it's got one neutron, so, I mean, one nucleon, so there we go. Now, that's not really uh, what we're going to be concerned with. Mostly, we're going to be looking at induced fission, where you cause it to happen, okay? So, you're going you're gonna to cause this artificially, so that, I think, is going to be the key thing right here, is this one right here. You're going to be causing fission artificially. What does that mean? Well, usually you add a neutron and that's going to make the nucleus unstable and that's going to cause it then to go through fission here. It's going to you know, make some new elements, some new nuclei. And in that process, of course, what happens? Well, you create new elements, but that means, oh, you also have your binding energy. You have this energy released when you made new elements and you also have some extra neutrons that fly out. So let's actually look at sort of a generic reaction here that's going on. So let's consider, for example, uh, one neutron. Let's consider that little guy right there. And it's going to be added to something. So let's make sure, uh, let's maybe add it to, actually it doesn't matter what the element is. We can make anything. Maybe I'll make like a black box just to represent whatever. All right, well, what happens now? Well, that is going to become something new. So maybe it's going to make like, you know, some other element. Okay, fine. Uh, plus, what else? Well, another element. Again, I mean, we'll be we'll be filling in these details later, but this is just going to be the idea. Plus, now what sometimes happens is you end up with multiple um, neutrons. So, for example, maybe you have two neutrons, maybe. Maybe two neutrons come out of this thing. But don't forget, you also have energy because E equals mc squared, so you also have this energy coming out of this. So this is a generic idea that one neutron can be added to something, make some new things, maybe it spits out some extra neutrons plus some energy. And the key thing then is going to be this idea of a chain reaction. So this is going to be interesting that you're going to produce neutrons. So look at this, you have one neutron starting off here, you end up making two more neutrons. And guess what can happen with those? Those neutrons, each of them can create another one of these. So another neutron will create this other thing and make two more. Another one makes two more and two more. And you have this reaction that feeds itself and it grows and grows and grows. That's why it's called a chain reaction. And if we have a nuclear uh, reactor, for example, if we're trying to get power from this, we want a chain reaction. But we don't want too much, do we? If it's too much, for example, then it overheats. That's bad. If it's too little, that's also bad. So you have to have just the right amount of reaction. You know, you want to be able to control these neutrons that are coming out of the reaction in order to start and feed the next chain. All right, so what is this enriching uranium business? Well, what you actually dig out of the ground... For example, most of what you find in the ground is actually uranium-238. So, for example, you can dig a big hole in the ground. You can actually find this stuff. Now, uranium-238 is pretty stable. It's, it's not going to go through fission very often uh, on its own. Um, so that's not a very good fuel to use for a reactor. But there's a small proportion, like, you know, a small, small percentage of what you find you know, when you're digging up uranium. A small percentage of it is actually this special one called uranium-235. 
Turns out that one is really helpful because it's it's not very stable. So this one right here, if you throw neutrons at it, it likes to make new reactions. So that's why we want this U-235 to make a reactor. But here's the problem. Remember, what you dig out of the ground is 238. So what do you do? Well, if there's only a small percentage of what you dig out of the ground you know, is 235 compared to the 238, what do you actually do? You enrich the uranium. What does it mean to enrich it? You don't add 235 to it. No, you're trying to isolate it. So imagine you dig out of the ground, you have a bunch of stuff, a bunch of, you know, dirt and rocks and things, and only a very, very small percentage of it is actually this uranium-235 that you're looking for. The rest of it, you don't really care. So what do people do? They enrich uranium, and what that means is there's a, a few ways. You can do it with some weird chemicals, but a common way, at least, that used to be used was a centrifuge. So you take this uh, uranium and you spin it mega ridiculously fast, and it turns out then that's actually going to separate them by weight. So in other words, uh, the more massive ones, you know, will, will separate it from the less massive ones. And you end up then, if you do this over many, many series, you end up with some material that's enriched, which means it has a higher percentage of uranium-235 than you normally would find. Okay, so enriched uranium has more uranium-235 in it. And that's actually what's used for, a, well, unfortunately, it's the same thing. You use the same fuels for reactors or for nuclear bombs and weapons and things like that. You actually use the same thing. So let's, let's focus on uranium. So let's go through and look at some example reactions here. By the way, I put this one. Is uranium edible? <laughs> Once. <laughs> So let's let's go through something here. So let's say we start with uranium-235. So I'll just draw it right here. So let's say so it's a 92 and a 235. And what do you do? You add a neutron to it. So maybe I'll just add a neutron to it. There we go. Neutron plus uranium-235. What can that make? Well, if I'm uh, just looking at this right here, 0 plus 92 is still 92. That means it's still uranium. But 235 plus 1 is 236. But don't forget, you still get plus energy. And what kind of energy? Remember, that's related to, uh, well, E equals mc squared. Okay, so now we have a uranium-236 that's coming out of this. Now, this uranium-236 that we just made, it's not stable. So it's on its own, it's going to uh, not live very long. Well, what does it do? Well, it's going to have a decay by itself. So it's going to decay into barium-144. So I'll write barium with a 144 and also uh, Krypton-90, and Krypton is 36, this right here is 56. Okay, now what's gonna happen then? We're going to end up making, uh, well, if we do the math right here, we, it turns out we need uh, two neutrons for this. That's because we have 144 plus 90. Well, that's gonna be 234, but I'm missing two more. So what I'm gonna do is this, I'm gonna end up with two neutrons. Let's see if I go one like this right here. See, so two times one, so that'll that'll work. And of course, then plus energy, because I always have this energy whenever I'm making new things. Okay, so what's interesting then is we've now made two neutrons. Now each of these neutrons can then in turn bombard one of these right here. So for example, that one one of the neutrons we just made, well, it's going to come back and start our reaction again. So that little one is used then to start this process. And guess what? The other one is also going to do the same. So to see we've created this chain reaction. This one right here and this one right here then, you know, those ended up coming from here, right? So this one right here, it ended up making these these extra ones which start this reaction again. Of course, that thing then is going to decay, make some more. So this is the idea behind this chain reaction. So we have an example now where we've got a neutron-induced fission reaction. So that means we have something like this uranium-235, and you throw a neutron at it. What does it do? Well, it makes uh, krypton-92 and barium-141. Okay. And then we're going to be told here, oh, we don't know how many neutrons are here. But of course, it also makes energy. So the first part is, hey, what's the number of neutrons produced? In other words, what's this number right here? I think what helps to do is just to consider what we're looking at here. So on this, maybe we'll look at like the left side right here. So this side right here, let's look at the number on the top right here. So the total nucleon number is 235 plus 1 is a 236. Bottom number is a 92. All right, well, that's supposed to become, let's just count up everything that we have so far. So, so far, let's see, what do we have? We have uh, 92 plus 141. That's 233. 
The bottom number right here, uh, 36 plus 56, oh, that works, that's, that's 92, so we're okay there. So do you notice then, so what's missing then? What do we need to have here? Well, we're going to need to have, let's see, 233 to get to 236, we need a three here. Do you notice, we need a three going on here at the top, and we need zero here. All right, well, if we're going to do that, here, maybe I'll just make it like this here, we need a zero down here. Well, what's going to be that? That's going to be three neutrons, because three neutrons will give us this top number of three. So can you see how that's how we can conclude? We need three neutrons. Okay, so for part B then, what I've done is I've just rewritten the uh, decay equation with our three that we just found here, with our three neutrons. And now we're supposed to calculate the energy in mega electron volts released in this reaction. In other words, what's this energy here? We want it to one decimal place. Now we're told some of the nuclides and their atomic masses. So we've got the nuclide, we've got the mass here for this one. We've got the mass for krypton, we've got the mass for barium. Here's the problem though, what about these neutrons? Where are those ones? So we're going to need to find that. So this we actually find in your data booklet. So mass of a neutron, if you look near the front of the data booklet there, it's 1.008665U. That's good, we have that. And don't forget also, we need to worry about, oh well, not worry about, we need to figure out what's a U in terms of MeV. So we're going to look that up as well. And 1U equals 931.5 MeV per C squared. So to go ahead and calculate this, so I think it helps to maybe just you know split this up into sort of left hand side and right hand side. So I'll find the mass of the left hand side and I'll find the mass of the right hand side. Let's go ahead and figure these out. And I'm just going to use all these different numbers here. So we've got 235 for example plus one neutron. And on the right side, remember we have one krypton plus one barium plus three times neutron. Okay, so I'll just add up these numbers right here, and I'll add up these numbers right here. All right, now all I have to do then is just subtract these two numbers, so this one minus this one right here, we'll subtract them, and we'll find the mass defect. Okay, what do I do with that? Well, now I'm ready, because now I finally have my equation. Well, E equals mc squared, that's my equation for the energy released. That's the binding energy. And this mass defect, that's the number I'm going to put in here. Okay, so I'm going to have a, uh, E equals M, which is this 0 0.18597. Now remember what 1U is. A U is 931.5, uh, and it's MeV per C squared. Just to remind you, that's because this right here is actually what 1U is. And don't forget that we're still multiplying by C squared. So we multiply by C squared. And what happens? Hopefully you can see it. We see the C squareds cancel out. Then I'm just going to multiply then this number by 931.5 and I'm going to get 173.2311 mega electron volts. Now I'm supposed to write my answer to one decimal place. So that means, okay, I'm finally done. I'm just going to say my energy is approximately equal to, well, it'll be 173.2. And that'll be mega electron volts. And thankfully I didn't have to do any conversions. This is everything I needed. We are done this question. Yay!